Hi, I'm John Sruto, and welcome back to part two with Mark Diano, award-winning columnist and journalist with the Nork Star Ledger, Pulitzer Prize finalist and author, and Mark really enjoyed part one. And part two, let's talk a little bit about our state, state of New Jersey. Sure. Um, go ahead. <laughs> you know, Mark, I, I, I know you love New Jersey, and uh, like you, I born and raised here, only wanted to live here, a little parochial in thought, mm -hmm. at least to this point. But, you know, we have so many good things and some things that we need to work about. Let's talk a little bit about what makes New Jersey so unique and so appealing for people like us. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things that's so interesting about the state is, like, the, even the diversity of landscape, you know, from uh, it takes you maybe two hours to get from high point to Sandy Hook, you know, uh, you know, you have these the, the highlands, and then you know, the, the, the like sort of a plateau of uh, the farms, and then the sandy thing. You know, you have the Pine Barrens, this you know huge expanse of flat land, sandy soil, water uh, water filtration, and then you know, 90 minutes away, you have the exact opposite landscape, but serves the same purpose. The the reservoirs and everything in the mountains up there. So that, that to me was always kind of interesting, like the, 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 the geography and geology in this like compact place, you know, that gave you these experiences of many different things. Um, that, that was one of the things I found most attractive. And then, you know, the other thing was, you know, the history of the state and um, how, well, as you know, I think uh, part of my career was, you know, one of the big aspects of my career was, you know, con continually pounding the drum for the state to take greater ownership of our American Revolutionary War history. Um, because really the war of attrition was won here. And, and what's really interesting, John, is that, you know, when I say here, I mean like here. Summit, Milburn, the Wachung Mountains. Uh, you know, Springfield George, Union. Yeah. I mean, George Washington spent three and a half years of the war in and around these mountains. And, and as, a, as a geologic structure, they, they protected the army, you know, between the, the, the great swamps around the mountains and the mountains themselves. You know, this, was, this is where they hid. And, and the British found it to not be, they weren't able to penetrate it. Now, now we drive up Route 24 or 124 at you know 90 miles an hour through the Hobart Gap, but you know you could also look over some cliffs in Springfield and say, hey, this is this was a formidable kind of thing you wanted to bring you know 10,000 pound cannons up, right? So um, I think that for our region especially, we we should know a lot more about its role in the foundation of the country. Well, you know, you had also mentioned at one point, I remember hearing you saying uh, the Beacon Hill Club right, right. now <clears throat> was really a beacon lookout mm -hmm. over the Hobart Gap right, for right. Washington's troops. Right, there was a series of those beacons like all the way up, you know, into, into, the, into the Catskills pretty much um, uh, to see where, where the British were coming. But the Battle of Springfield, I think, is um, probably the most overlooked battle in the in the in the um, in the history of the Revolution because it's the last battle in the North. You know, when when the British were repelled finally from making you know getting punching through the Wachung Mountains, they returned to Staten Island, and between the French coming down and their inability to take Jersey, New Jersey, completely, they left. They went, to, they went south and then the war ended in Virginia. Um, and the other thing that I think is lost in history, which is very important about the war itself, is that New Jersey was not only really important geographically, because we were between the, 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 the Delaware and the Hudson, but also politically because you know, it was, it was also one of the most fractured states in terms of support. You know, so we had, you know, Tories, 33% Tories, 33% uh, Patriots, and 33% Dutch and Quakers and other people who didn't, didn't care, you know. And so to try to sway that balance 
was, was really important for the British to gain a greater foothold here, and they never really could. And, you know, I didn't learn any of this until I started looking at it as a journalist. Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but um, I can tell you this. I raised uh, two kids in Madison and four kids in Mountain Lakes, and not one of those kids ever took a field trip to the Ford Mansion. Okay, but now, that being said, I mean, is it because there's an apathetic approach to history in today's world, our history, our immediate history here on the local level, if we become too globalized, or are we failing, or maybe in both cases, Mark, are we failing as a state not promoting that and highlighting this like other states do? Well, that I, that I believe is true. I mean, I do believe that the state has repeatedly failed at this. And I can, I can actually give you a good example of this. In 1958, the Montgomery County, Pennsylvania Chamber of Commerce or some group saw that the centennial was coming 18 years away and they decided to form you know the valley forge visitor thing right valley forge gets Center, yeah. yeah valley forge gets something like five million visitors a year who dump a billion dollars into their economy you know the the uh, jockey hollow and the ford mansion get nine hundred thousand visitors a year and that counts the guy who walks his dog there every day is 365. So, and they, they poured almost nothing into the economy. We are now approaching the, um, well, I can't even say it, it's the 250 year anniversary, right? And I, I don't see great preparation here about what we're doing. In fact, when, when they announced the commission, uh, the government commission for that, nobody from New Jersey was even on it. And uh, so I think it's just going to be the kind of history that repeats itself. And I think there's reasons for that. I think that because real estate is so expensive, because it's an entryway for immigration, uh, I think that, you know, um, we'll turn over the history very quickly. The new immigrants, you know, my, 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 my father's father, you know, here, I'll give you a perfect family example. My grandparents lived near the Battle of Springfield in da down on Main Street in Milburn. My father was a teacher. I wrote a book. So there's a progression. And my grandfather could have cared less about George Washington. He was trying to feed his family. My father became interested in it educationally. And then third generation, I write the book, right? I write the American Revolution book. So I think that there's a progression here in New Jersey that's different. We don't have you know, your great, 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 great grandpappy is not buried in the cemetery, you know, at, on the outskirts of town. And so I think because of that, that churn of, of people, immigration, and, and then you also people coming here just to work. You don't have that same kind of Texas pride. It and, makes you know, sense, yeah. Mark. It really does. When you, when you think about it, we are a gateway. Yeah. And you know what? And you're right. It's about survival at first, and that first tier of, of, of economic level of, of coming to the country. You're just looking to be accepted and to survive on it. But, you know, again, I think the state, you know, we go up to Massachusetts or you go to some of the other states, and you know, whether it's just a visitor center or some kind of sign, you know, we have a lot of people coming into Newark Airport, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any information on Newark Airport about New Jersey? No, just I love New York t-shirts, you know, oh. which is really, um, you know, every time I'm in the airport, I'm more and more disturbed by how we don't take advantage of any kind of branding about this place. Simple branding. You know, you know, and then like you travel in a place like, you know, I, I did this tour of the South a couple years ago by myself. It was great. You know, Mississippi, Tennessee, these places that just have like every, every turnpike or every, every highway rest stop has some historic element to it. There, there's, you know, the, you, you get to understand the place even even in the peripheral travel through an interstate. And, um, and we have nothing like that. I mean, I, you, know, you know, as you know, I've written columns about it. You, know, you come in on Route 78, nothing. Route 80, nothing. Uh, actually, Route 80, there's, a, there's a, a, a place with a vending machine and a couple <laughs> of brochures. Route 280, nothing. The Turnpike 
is named after famous New Jerseyans, but there's almost nothing in the building itself about that, about either the person or the region or anything else. On the rest stops, yeah, right, as, as you go up the street. You know, you mentioned something. You know, you, you learn and you to, to try to understand the cultural makeup personality of a certain area when you go to a Tennessee or a Kentucky when they have a history there. You had the opportunity, and I remember reading a couple of columns to go back for the first time ever and see some of your old roots in Italy. And, yeah. and, and you know, you had some tremendous takeaways from that. Why don't you just share a couple of the ideas that the region that you went to visit and what you really saw from those people that you can maybe now understand in yourself and the people that you were raised by. Well, I'll tell you, this is so this is so interesting and so uh, unique to your viewership area because uh, the town that um, my family was from, my father's family was from, and many other uh, Summit, Milburn, and Orange type in that area, Italians were from a village called San Bartolomeo, and when you go there, uh, it it's sort of like looking at the names of the uh, suburban Essex phone book, you know. <laughs> All the names are the same, you know, and, and uh, you see people that look like people you've grown up around your whole life, you know, the same surnames, the same look. Uh, you know, the, you know, I I went up to the bell tower at the top of uh, San Bartolomeo, and um, the guy who was taking me up there had the same last name as my grandmother's maiden name and she was from there also and my grandfather was too um, and so you know I, I learned a couple of things about you know this the idea of um, this you know you go from this remote village and then you're thrown into a wealth belt like here you know my father's father was a landscaper on the day estate in Short Hills? In Short Hills. So he went from, you know, the mountain town in Italy to a cold water flat on Main, off of Main Street in Milburn to working at the Day Estate. And so, you know, the, 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 this transition of like, that American transition of like, okay, I'm here and that might actually be attainable. You know, there's an, there's an opportunity, maybe it's slim, but, but that exists. Because over there, it doesn't exist. You know, over there, it doesn't exist. You know, they don't have the same kind of capitalistic commerce and things like that. So, but on the other hand, you know, some, the simplicity of life and the, and the, the, the sort of uh, the cocoon of family is, is much stronger. So when I, when I was in San Bartolomeo, my father went back when he was a kid and he was explaining to me where his cousin lived. His cousin's 100 years old. And sure enough, you know, by following my father's description, I found the house that his father grew up in, you know, and that the family is still in that house. And the, the same thing happened to me in Potenza when, uh, with my mother's family. My mother's first cousin, who's my age, because you know the the span of of my grandfather's siblings was over twenty five years. Um, I, I leave this little B and B I'm staying at. We walk across the street, and he points to a house, and he says, "That's the house your grandfather was born in." Now, my grandfather was born in eighteen ninety eight, and this guy is like the same age as me, but he had that sense of the family history connection and the connection. And they all lived within these apartments, like right there. And, and it's just interesting. Like, uh, I had two of the second cousins or whatever. You know, woman's a nurse. She's like in her th late thirties, and the guy, work, he's, a, he's a photographer, but he also works in some kind of steel foundry. They still live at home. <laughs> they still live in their bedrooms. You know, <laughs> because they're not married, and this is what you do. You just stay there. This is your house. You stay with your mother and father. You're, you're, and then, you know, you get married, then you go out. <laughs> that explains a lot to me, Mark, right now, right <laughs> yeah, there. Right. But it's interesting. You know, yeah. I know that you went back, and, and, and so many people in this country, you know, really their genesis 
is from that type of background, you know, no matter what country it is. And I, I think what I took away from your article is if it's safe, it's certainly pleasurable to go back because you, you, you pull together an understanding of who you are today and how, how you, your family evolved to this point. Um, you know, Mark, you know, John, I have to tell you, this is so, it's really important that I think I tell you this. Sure. When I, I, when I, go, when I went to San Bartolomeo the first time, I drove with a paper map from the Naples airport. And I'm getting lost, and I, you know, trying to figure out where I'm going around these mountains. You know, everything looks kind of the same. And then you finally get there, and man, when I got there, there was some kind of innate, you know, this just inherent pull that like nails my feet to the pavement. That like you belong here. I mean, it was it was a powerful feeling. A and the and the funny part of it was I didn't know how to reach these relatives. And so I went to buy uh, uh, some toothpaste, which I had forgotten, and I asked the guy at the, the pharmacy if he knew Frank Diano. <laughs> oh yeah, Frank, he says. And he points me in this direction, and I start walking, and I don't know where I am, and I see these guys fixing a fountain or something, and I say, hey, do you guys know Frank? And the guy goes, yeah, Frank, yeah, sure, Frank. And he gets on the phone, he starts talking to somebody, who turns out to be his cousin, who's Frank's wife, but I can't understand anything. So then the guy tells me to go over there, and he says, uh, and, and the only thing I could remember him saying was the Bar Luna, Bar Luna. So now it's getting dark, and I'm walking around. I've only been there like a half an hour, but, and I remember where I was parked uh, next to this uh, caged-in soccer field. I could hear the kids playing, so I walk down there. I see my car, and it's right in front of the Bar Luna. <laughs> so I go into the Bar Luna, and I say, do you know Frank, Frank Diano? He goes, yeah, Frank. And he comes to the back window and he points to the house. <laughs> I was in town for less than an hour before I found the guy, right? And yeah. within 15 minutes, we're in the car driving to some other town to some dinner, you know? As if you knew him yeah, forever, yeah, right? Yeah, forever. It, it was just it's, great. It's, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, you know, in your article, you had recommended that if possible, people should go back, you yeah. know, for some kind of visit. And you were well received. Mark, you know, we, again, you know, bringing things back here to New Jersey at this point, you know, um, the state itself, we're, you know, we talk about the different political structures and people's positions and all. Do you think that, you know, this country has become a situation of multiple, multiple, multiple political positions and parties, or are we really a lot of similarities, but we just can't pull it together. Well, I think, I think, you know, we have enormous similarities, but you know, one of the problems that we have is that any discussion of American nationalism somehow gets transformed into like Nazism. Like we don't, we don't have, we don't have those binding civic experiences like serving in the army uh, I, I actually believe in a conscription. I do. I think there should be a two-year conscription, not just for the military, but go work in the forest service. You know, go do some environmental work. Work in healthcare. Be surrounded by people that are not like you. You know, my roommate in hospital core school in the Navy was this black kid from rural Georgia. You know, I mean, this kid was as far backward. You know, as from I Summit, was New Jersey, sure. uh, from some in New Jersey, but he was my roommate, you know, and 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 so we got to know each other, be thrown into that situation. The, the polarization that we feel in this country now is is because we don't know each other. I, I've never been more infuriated by anything I have ever heard in my life when um, after 9-11 on television, they interviewed this young stockbroker and asked him if he was, you know, they were, you know, man in the street thing, would you consider going in the army? And he said, no, we pay people to do that. We pay people to do that. You know, this arrogance and this idea that service is somehow lower on the, on the, on the respectability pole than making a ton of money. And I'm not just talking about in the military, I'm talking about any kind of service. And so those binding experiences of, of, uh, of unity don't exist, and uh, and I, and I think I, um, you know, as a journalist, I tracked the 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 kind of political polarization went up, while the number of veterans in Congress went down, 
you know, and, and I remember as a kid, you know, Hubert Humphrey loses the election and he says, well, now I'm behind the president and the, the president is this and that. And somehow I think this all changed when, after Bill Clinton was elected, that partisanship, because those World War II veterans had marched off the timeline, it became party first, country second. And so since Bill Clinton was elected in our country, We've really had nothing, the, all, the, all, the, all the politicians try to do is wreck the other guy's presidency. That's all they try to do. You know, we're not getting anything done. They're just trying to destroy the other guy's presidency. The really only major uh, galvanizing period for us, of course, was right after 9-11. Right, right. And, uh, you know, of course, you wrote a lot about 9-11 in those days. Um, you talked about one disappointment though at a football game. I think Navy was playing oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Rutgers. Yeah, yeah. And why don't you share that? Yeah, that was a that was a crazy story because I was in the stands, I had season tickets, and they had this nine eleven memorial uh, to the kids from Rutgers who had either died in the explosion or in the subsequent wars. And yeah, you know, we're watching it and everybody's sad, you know, in the half mass flag and, you know, they clap at the end. And then the Naval Academy runs out on the field. And the kids start cursing and booing them. <laughs> I mean, vulgarly, you know, can't, things I can't say on your show. Yeah. And I'm like, man, like, I'm not, it's not just, it wasn't just appalling. It was embarrassing that they're that stupid. The kids at our state university don't realize that these are the guys that are going to be over there next. You know, that they don't see, they don't understand that part. They're so distant from it, you know. I mean, you know, John, I, I, I've taught college for 12 years uh, after, you know, uh, in, the, in the 2000s, you know, and um, I never saw an anti-war protest at Rutgers in any college. These kids are so far detached from it, you know, that they don't, they have, the country has no skin in the game in, in wars. And the country, I can extrapolate that to say, I don't think the country, many people in the country feel they have any skin in the game for the betterment of the country. You know, um, we tear down, uh, we don't build up. Uh, you know, we've been shown by our corporations that, hey, it doesn't matter if we, if we bankrupt this town and take everything out and send it to China because we can make more money. You guys, screw you. You know, that, that sense of nationalism, that sense of, you know, America, you know, protecting itself. Um, has has really kind of dissipated in our lifetime, you know, and... Um, As you said, there's been a fundamental shift. Of course, we had a draft for many years where people, for the most part, did serve sure. periods in the military or Navy in, in some form of the armed forces. And we've gotten away from that now for 45, 50 years. And as you say, I think there's less people in the armed forces now than at any, ever, ever, ever. 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 The the well, that, and that's interesting because the proportion of Americans serving in the military is smaller than ever, which means the amount of families who are impacted by our military adventurism is smaller low. than ever. The all-time low. Right. Mark, these last few minutes, I want to just throw some things at you real quickly because you know, just I could talk to you for another hour, but we can't uh, take that type of time today. Uh, what are you most proud of professionally? Oh man, I don't know. Uh, I think professionally I'm most proud of the fact that uh, I finally transitioned into novelist, which is what I always dreamed of doing. It's frustrating. Uh, I've, I've not maybe reached the point of, of uh, success that I wanted to as a novelist, but it's still in front of me and I'm still able to be uh, you know productive, and I and also I'm very proud of the fact that you know in my work with the city with Ras Baraka, uh, you know I'm 64 years old and I still have a career in front of me. It's nice, a new career like and you know especially coming out of my business, that's a gift from God. You know because so many people in my business have just been you know let go at the at the cusp of retirement and you know are are really scrounging around it's and it's I'm just really really lucky in that way so I think that's what I'm proud of the most is that I've been able to you know uh, um, adjust 
transition, 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 and recreate and to recreate. some degree or expand. Yeah, and 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 still operate it at what I think is a pretty good level. I mean, I think that's a really good book, you know. And I think the book I'm working on now is a really good book. They're powerful. Okay. All right, let's talk about some really good writers. Do you have a favorite author or two? Well, I really uh, Bernard Malamud was my sort of writing idol, um, uh, and uh, really read everything that he did. Um, and uh, I'm actually uh, kind of enamored with another Jersey guy, uh, Paul Auster, who uh, he's a, he was from West Orange, and uh, his last book, Four Three Two One, all takes place in Maplewood and Love oranges. It. Love the New Jersey yeah. landscape, yeah. which you do yeah. so yeah, well. Yeah, you know everywhere and, the guys. And we talked about, about yeah. Corbin from from yeah. Livingston, yeah. the same thing. Yeah, I'm going to keep throwing these questions at you, Mark, till that red light goes on, but. Uh, Jerry Eisenberg, real quickly, what did he mean to you? You're such well, a wonderful yeah. columnist, great writer. Jerry was my mentor. Uh, we're still in touch. I dedicated my first book to him, The Last Newspaper Man. I had him in college. He only taught at Rutgers Newark for one semester, and then he, he was frustrated by it. Uh, and he took me under his wing and just made sure that, like, when I went to a big event, you know, I was a guy from the Morristown Record, you know, Come down, make him sit, get him down at ringside. Get him, you know, and, I, and, and then when I got to the New York Post as a sports columnist, he and I always sat together because they put the columnists in the second row. So Jerry and me were always together. And Jerry also was published in the Post at some point. So, so you know, not only did I have him as a, as, a, as, a, as a teacher and a mentor, but then as a colleague for many, many years. And I edited his uh, farewell columns and then which became a book through my eyes uh and you know he calls me once a week i call him you know you yeah. became great friends yeah we were friends you know. mark uh you know i know you were an adjunct for many many years at rutgers newark and uh you saw the evolution of education but we've also had discussions about this it's, it's exorbitant and you know uh, there seems to be almost like a marketing approach to making sure that you try to attain a certain level and that certain level goes with dollars. Is it as necessary as, unfortunately, a lot of us think? Well, especially in this area. You know, I remember when, uh, you know, I've got six kids. I remember when I told people that my, my middle daughter was going to start at the County College of Morris. They looked at me like I said she's going to spend a couple <laughs> years in porn, you know? The happiest day of my life was when my youngest boy came into my room as a junior in high school and said, Dad, I want to come out of college debt free. And he did. You know, he, he, we sent him to county for a couple of years. He had a great education, Morris County College. Um, I think the COVID is going to really change how people look at, especially those first two years of undergraduate work. What am I spending $60,000 for? $75,000. And so many kids are left with such a strapping debt, you know, for it's, many it's years. It's crippling. Ahead. It's really crippling. Well, Mark Diano, let me tell you, I miss your columns, as I've mentioned many times tonight. Uh, I miss talking to you. This has been great. You are just uh, a world of information about so many things. I want to have you back down the road, hopefully. And, you know, we're really, really blessed to have a New Jersey man like Mark Diano. So thank you so much for joining us here at HTTV. Thank you, John. It's always great to come in and talk to you. And we're going to do it again. All right, John. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this very special Mark Diano two-part interview.